All right. Hello. Um, we'll start with uh, just what is your name? How do you what do you go by or your artist name? Hi, Natasha. Very nice to meet you. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is Jose Elizondo. Um, I'm originally from Mexico, uh, but I live now in the U.S. All right. Perfect. Um, so what is your earliest cello memory? My earliest and one of the most cherished me uh, memories is a concert I attended actually at MIT uh, with Carlos Prieto, this extraordinary Mexican cellist who also happens to be an alum from MIT. Um, and uh, he played the Bach suites. And in particular, I remember very well listening to him play uh, the Bach suite number one and uh, it was just such a absolutely wonderful uh, situation, not only because the performance was extraordinary, but it was also discovering this piece for the first time for me. Wow. So very special, a very special concert. That's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's a cool experience to be kind of brought into the cello world, so to speak, through the Bach suites. I think, I think a lot mm -hmm. of people have been, have been exposed to the cello as a solo instrument in that way, actually. Um, yes. And Yo-Yo Ma continues to help us remember that the Bach suites are, are a place to find peace and, and joy. Absolutely. I mean, I have been, of course, a, a great Yo-Yo Ma fan for all my life. Yeah. Uh, I basically was introduced to his wonderful world of, of cello at around the same time, actually, that this concert happened. And I think it was basically as a consequence of my being so impacted by this beautiful rendition of the, the, the cello suites by Mr. Prieto that I started to explore more about this instrument. And of course, you know, um, you can't uh, be a, a lover of cello and not know the wonderful work of Maestro Yo-Yo Ma, who's just an extraordinary yeah. artist yeah. and an amazing person. Yeah. But I'm so glad you mentioned Carlos Prieto because I, I never, I don't really, I don't know, I've, I've heard his, his, his name, of course. I know him from my general cello background. Um, but mm -hmm. but I love that you're talking about him because I feel like sometimes uh, you know, some cellists really just need to be always brought back into the public consciousness. There are so many amazing cellists that are not, you know, one of the top three or whatever. Well, and I think he's a really one of a kind um, because in addition of being, you know, a very respected and very loved cellist, particularly an iconic figure in Latin America, He's an inspiration in many ways. I mean, he basically was, uh, you know, as I told you, a student at MIT. So he studied, uh, I think, two different careers. If I'm not mistaken, it was something like material science and economics uh, or something, Amazing. something like that. And, you know, he did a lot of interesting work in Mexico, um, in, both in the area of business, and, you know, and also finance and was extremely, extremely successful in, in that area, very respected as an icon for that particular, uh, you know, sort of field as well. Uh, but since he was a child, he was exposed to, to uh, you know, wonderful music and he was so talented. Um, and he had the, the fortune and he also made the, the effort to get in touch with composers from a very early age. Um, some of the biggest icons in composition in the 20th century and 21st century have written pieces for him. There's something like, I want to say 200 pieces that have been composed for him, commissioned by him. And this includes pieces like the father of Mexican classical music, Manuel M. Ponce, by uh, Joaquin Rodrigo, by like, you know, like everybody you can think of that are, you know, uh, you know the who and who, who is who, for, I'm sorry, of composition in the 20th century wrote pieces for um, the Maestro Prieto and was a personal friend of, of his and wow. like, with Shostakovich. And he spent some time uh, write, studying about Russia and, and uh, you know, sort of like writing about it. And he's a phenomenal author, philanthropist. He's helped so many generations of people in Latin America to have a career. Yeah. He started a competition and he has rescued so many pieces that were unpublished by composers all over Latin America, I think it would be very difficult to find another figure that has made such an impact on the life, the, the repertoire, 
and just the life of an instrument at such a global uh, level. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. amazing. I didn't I didn't know most of that. That's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, we can see that you're absolutely a lover of, of uh, cello and cellists uh, specifically, yes. um, but you're not a cellist yourself, right? Um, what, no. What's your musical background then? Um, so I started um, with piano and organ when I was like five years old. And I was, uh, you know, I loved performance. It was uh, one of my dreams to sort of be able to become a performer. I did a lot of recitals. I did a lot of competitions. And um, unfortunately, by the time that I, um, you know, uh, decided to go to university, I ruined my hands. Um, it was a very um, difficult situation where I could no longer play. Mm -hmm. It had to do with uh, basically the fact that at the time I was studying at MIT, I was doing electrical engineering and computer science, and I was, you know, doing a lot of work with my hands on the, on the, the keyboards at the time. Uh, we didn't understand the ergonomics that well. It was the early 90s. Yeah. I was in my free time. I was doing all this other work at the piano keyboard. And in any case, it, it was not a very good situation. Mm. But there's always a positive thing that comes out later. And that was that because I could no longer perform, I had to find other ways to remain engaged in music. And I ended up basically taking more classes in music history and music analysis. And eventually, when I realized that I, I could complete a music major as well, even though I was studying engineering, uh, then the only, uh, the, the only subjects left to complete that were, you know, harmony and counterpoint and, you know, things related to composition. And so that's how I entered that world sort of by accident. <laughs> yeah, I, I, and sort of like one of the homeworks that I was assigned by one of my professors in one of these uh, few composition <laughs> classes I um, became basically my most performed composition for orchestra wow. and propelled me into that. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Um, one of the things that I that I know, at least from my experience with composing, is that I often have uh, sort of emotions or, or locations or kind of uh, situations that kind of drive how I th think of new pieces. Um, but what would you consider sort of your inspirations? Where do you, where do you draw inspiration for your music? There's always multiple layers to, to the, the inspiration of a piece. Uh, I'm thinking, for example, of a composition I wrote called The Dawn of Hope. Um, I wrote that two years ago. And so part of it is like the explicit inspiration of the commission. So I was uh, commissioned to write this piece for two very specific events. One of them was the 100th anniversary of the armistice that ended World War I. It's a very meaty event that has so many interesting aspects and so many emotions and it's so important uh, and so it has a lot of uh, places where you can go with your inspiration from that yeah. and then the second event was the uh, world youth days which is an event where a lot of young people from all over the world come together to basically focus their energy on how to make this this world a better place and so there was also this element of hope from there so that's the explicit sort of like uh, element then yeah. there's personal element and in this case, um, that I had suffered some losses in my family. Uh, you know, some, some people very dear to me had passed away right before this, this uh, time. And so the, the personal journey I was going through from mourning to having hope about life again was a very, very big driving force as well behind the, the, the writing of that composition. And then there's musical inspiration where like you're very moved or very touched by a certain composer or a certain melody or something. And you um, find that, that, that you want to sort of like, you know, either respond to it or write something in that, that vein. And so it was, uh, yeah, there's always those different layers that help me basically uh, come up with something of my own and, and present uh, a statement that is a musical statement, but that always has also uh, an emotional message or like a story behind it yeah oh wow, that's yeah that sounds that sounds a, a lot like like how i like how i think of it but i've never put it into so many perfect words that way <laughs> um <laughs> one of the things that i like asking is uh also what 
what inspired you? Do you remember your first composition or arrangement? I do, and uh, well, and specifically for the cello, if I may, because my first piece was for orchestra. It was the one that I described as a homework for my class, but the first piece for cello, I was very lucky because I, after attending this uh, event that I told you, this concert with Carlos Prieto, so as a fan, I go there and I'm like, you know, Mr. Prieto, could I please have your autograph, right? And so as I'm talking to him for this, he basically mentions, you know, so yeah, sure, who do I make it to? And I'm like, Jose Lizondo, and he says, oh, I spoke with one of your professors yesterday and he showed me your orchestra piece and I really love it. Why don't we uh, have lunch tomorrow? And so we did. And during that lunch, he commissions me to write him a piece, a cello duet uh, for a concert he was planning to do with Yo-Yo Ma. And wow. Can you imagine like, you know, a, a, a little kid, you know, who has never written anything for cello, who has only one real piece uh, <laughs> composition out there talking to his icon yeah hero and being commissioned to write for him and his other hero as well so this oh, that's unbelievable yeah I couldn't have been luckier and of course also because both are you know such kind and wonderful generous characters that is not just you know like you know music you know, that needs to be pretty and virtuosic, but you know that there's gonna be a lot of heart behind their performances. And and so I I also wanted, at the time I was very much into exploring um, sort of like music from Latin America. I was sort of just starting to, to understand what it meant to write music in a Latin American idiom and who were the, the Latin American classical composers. And so I was very lucky to choose as, as the, the means of my uh, exploration of cello, uh, you know, Latin American based dances. And so I wrote this piece called Latin American Dances, Dances Latino Americanas. And I wrote a, a, a tango, a bossa nova and a jarabe, which is a Mexican dance. Um, and because, you know, I was writing it for these wonderful people and I was able to sort of like uh, write something that was, you know, technically challenging and virtuosic, but also that um, represented the the tradition of of latin america and i wanted it to i didn't want it to sound like some sort of like abstracted very um how can i say very stylized version that barely resembled no i wanted the actual feeling that you were playing a tango and a real bossa nova and, and all that yeah and, and so i think i i i uh, you know, I try to remain as true to that as I could with that composition. And I've been very blessed because, um, you know, in addition to these extraordinary performers, there's been so many other people who have embraced this piece and it's brought a lot of joy into my life. Oh, that's wonderful. That's really beautiful. Uh, that's, uh, I guess that, that brings me sort of to my next uh, question. Uh, one, one of my favorite pieces in the cello ensemble repertoire is definitely the, uh, from, from Villa Lovo, Villa Lobos, actually, um, the the Bacchianas Brasileiras that are just absolutely incredibly written for for the cello ensemble. Um, but what yes. what do you would would you have a favorite uh, for for cello or cello ensemble that's not yours? Of course, many. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pick one or two. Well, I mean, I have to say because you mentioned Villa Lobos that he was actually one of my main inspirations for this piece. I mean, I basically was. Again, I was very young and I was modeling each of my pieces after particular masters of uh, classical music. And so the first movement, the tango, was, of course, indebted to Piazzolla. And Carlos yeah. Del, who's an extraordinary singer from Argentina, basically, is also one of the biggest icons in the, the, the tango world. Uh, but for the second movement, which is Brazilian inspired, of course, I had to make reference to the extraordinary Villa Lobos. And it's... Um, yeah, I mean, his music is, uh, is absolutely extraordinary, not only in its perfect craft, but also in the fact that he manages to bring, you know, very, very Latin American colors into it. When you listen to, for example, his ballet, Uda Puru, you basically are listening to the Amazon. It's just yeah. absolutely spectacular. And the lushness of his melodies and the fact that he's um, something that I strive to be, which is basically uh, to, to use tonality, unashamedly because it's a beautiful way to, to express reality. And, you know, like it is wonderful, of course, to, to also explore new idioms. And, and you know, I have 
uh, great respect for people who embrace the, the avant-garde, but it's not just not my my personal language. And so I love the the, the language of Villa Lobos, and uh, it's it's a wonderful um, yeah, uh, it's a wonderful composer to be inspired by. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Um, so you've uh, you were just saying you were you were really using different um, specific masters for your compositions, especially as a young composer. Uh, who would you consider um, sort of your your biggest role models? Uh, I guess we have Villa Lobos is, is definitely one of them. Yes. Well, Bach is the biggest, of course. I mean, I think um, it, it's, uh, you know, such a perfect expression of music, regardless of what he's writing, <laughs> that uh, you always will be enriched if you get close to Bach. Yeah. It's sort of a, <laughs> a, a, a pilgrimage that I think every every performer and every composer must make. Um, and it's always a, a, like an endless uh, source of inspiration. Um, for example, last year, I, I was very blessed that I was commissioned again to write a piece for Yo-Yo Ma and Carlos Prieto. So this is sort of like, it brings back the cycle, you know, uh, the, the way that I started. And um, I wrote a piece called Cantabrigian Reflections. Cantabrigian is, uh, you know, the way that you refer to things from Cambridge, in this case, Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, which is, uh, you know, not only the place where uh, Mr. Ma spends a lot of his time, but also um, it's a place where Yo-Yo Ma and Carlos Prieto and myself studied in, in the, the universities there. And uh, it was a, a piece that allowed me to uh, try to incorporate elements of reflection both literally in a musical sense or like you know melodies that sort of like you know imitate each other and and sort of like you know transform together uh, but also reflecting on the events that were happening last year and reflecting also for me in the inspiration that brought me into this cello adventure and because of course you know that goes back to this performance with Carlos Prieto and back and the fact that that same prelude in, you know that I heard with uh, Mr. Prieto is the most iconic piece played by Maestro Yo-Yo Ma. It's a, it's a piece that basically for me symbolizes both of them. And so I quote this piece, not the, the prelude, but like the, the, the minuet from the first suite. Yeah. In the middle, in the heart of this composition, this, this new composition, the Cantabrian Reflections. Wow. So it just shows that, you know, time and time again, I can come back to, to, to back for inspiration. And uh, it's, uh, it's always a, uh, a um, uh, wonderful adventure. <laughs> wow, well, that's exciting. Is it is it already um, released then this piece? Can we hear it? Because of the, the COVID situation, the premiere has not happened yet, but I'm, I'm hopeful that it will <laughs> happen at some point in the near future. Yeah, yeah, no, I think I think it will it will definitely happen <laughs> soon and then we will definitely be looking for it. Um, well, uh, which one of the questions I have is also which piece of yours or which arrangement of yours would you would you like to feature today? What, what, what would be one of the pieces you'd like to really uh, shine a special light on? I uh, I would love to to talk a little bit about the piece called Under the Starry Sky of the Rhine. Ah, yeah. I was very blessed to um, collaborate with German cellist Benedict Klöckner, who is uh, an extraordinary talent and just also a very kind and wonderful person. I've been very lucky that most of my collaborations have been with people that I truly admire and respect, not just in, as artists, but also just uh, in the, the way that they conduct themselves uh, otherwise. And um, he kindly asked me to write a piece um, and again, the, the Bach connection comes back here because he was about to record an album with the entire set of cello suites by Bach. And he asked basically several composers to write miniature pieces to respond or accompany each of the suites. Ah, oh, that's beautiful. Yes, and each composer from a different continent. And so it was basically this wonderful project of inclusion and inspiration. And uh, it was terrifying, of course, because <laughs> you have to have your music played right next to back it's like you know um you couldn't be any more exposed <laughs> yeah side by side <laughs> it's terrifying but it's also a wonderful opportunity and so my favorite piece and the piece that I actually first heard Benedict perform was uh the suite number six mm -hmm. I love that piece very very much it's uh, so full of joy and 
and you know love for life and in particular i love the jig the the, the last movement yeah um, so I decided to to use that as a starting point, and I didn't want to necessarily just make a derivative work from that. Um, so, but it, I, you know, I wanted to keep that as part of the the, the, the inspiration. And because um, you know, Benedict comes from this beautiful area in Germany, um, near near uh, you know near the Rhine, and it's an area that I spent a lot of time there, and it's such a beautiful place with so many fantastic landscapes and these medieval castles and everything. Yeah. So I figured that would be another perfect inspiration. And um, so the piece turned out to be like um, this imagined ride by a, a, a medieval knight through this landscape where, you know, basically he's so overwhelmed by the beauty of the landscape and in particular by the stars that he's, uh, you know, uh, has the, the, the opportunity to see in the sky that um, he just stops and starts to think about his life and has all these memories of the things that are important to him. Like, you know, what are his values? What has been, he, uh, what, what he has been fighting for? And, um, and so it's a piece that it has moments that are very epic and very, uh, you know, full of bravura. and It's just exciting. And then there's some other parts that are more uh, sort of romantic and, and contemplative. Um, so it's a very dynamic piece, very, challenging technically um but it's a lot of fun as well and uh you know so I wrote it first as a cello solo then um because uh, Benedict uh, you know was also going to play it in a an, in a festival with a very talented violinist uh, Yuri Revich I turned it into a suite in four movements uh, for cello and violin and now I have uh, transformed it again into a cello concerto Wow. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a, it's a fun piece, very exciting piece. And um, yeah, I, I encourage people to, to listen to one of the many wonderful uh, recordings that, that Benedict has done of it. And uh, tonight I actually have the privilege of having two concerts where this piece is going to be uh, performed by very talented um, cellists as well. So wow. that, that's the, the, the piece that I w would want to highlight today. Oh, that's super. That is, that's actually when, when I was preparing for this interview, I went through your website and I looked at some of the pieces you've written and I got all excited, you know, like, what can I add to my okay. repertoire? And, and I did stumble across that, that particular one. And I listened to one of the videos that, that Benedict had made. And I was really impressed. I was like, oh, that's, I mean, it's really challenging. I don't, I, you know, I have to decide when I'm going to learn this, but, um, but it was fantastic. And now knowing a little bit more about it, uh, you did have a description on your website, but of course, you know, like, probably every performing <laughs> I just went straight to the link and listened to it um wonderful yeah Thank but you. uh yeah no it was it was wonderful um so I I'm I'm sure that uh I'm sure that there will be other cellists who want to take on this challenge and I <laughs> am really excited that you're going to get to see it live a couple of times tonight yes very <laughs> much so it, it doesn't happen very frequently because it is such a challenging piece but um you know I'm very thrilled because to, uh, these two performances are just extraordinary Fantastic. Yeah. All right, thank you. Well then, um, well we're we're wrapping up this last few questions. Um, the I just wanted to ask one more time: Why should somebody play some of your music? What what uh, what do you think is the thing that they're going to really get the most out of it? So thank you for that question. Um, I think the reason that somebody should you know consider please, my music, is that um, it's music that can um, be understood and enjoyed, I think, by, by audiences. And, you know, it's music that doesn't, um, doesn't set a distance between the listener and the, the, the artist. It's music that is simple, but that usually is, has a very genuine uh, sense of hope or cheerfulness or uh, joy. And uh, I try to, to make my compositions so that they speak to people who are, you know, basically at any any um, step of their, their their musical journey, whether it's people who just want to have an emotional connection with a piece or people who want to listen to something that has, you know, a bit more layers in it. Um, the, most of the music that I write actually is quite joyful. I, I use a lot of dance, um, 
uh, settings in a sense for it. And um, I, feel, I feel that it's important, especially these days to, to have music that, that helps us you know, have moments of joy, of serenity uh, in a world that is anything but uh, simple these days. Um, and in particular, for example, I'll make a reference back to, to my piece, The Dawn of Hope, La Alborada de la Esperanza, which is a piece that basically talks about a journey through darkness into light and basically has a message of it is possible to overcome uh, difficult situations, no matter how, how challenging they seem. And it is important that we focus on love, compassion, and hope. And so um, I, I try to imbue my pieces with a sense of you know, this type of message. And so I think, um, especially in times like this, it is important that we give uh, space to, to music that is not just uh, you know, dramatic and complex and all that, but also that suits the soul. And um, I think in a, in a small way, you know, that, that is my uh, attempt at least, and uh, my hope that people will be able to, to see that in the music that I write and share it with the, the people that they care about and their audiences. And yeah, <laughs> that is my, my message. It's a beautiful message, Jose, thank you. Um, I, I totally agree. I think that your music does, does convey that the, the few pieces that I've heard so far. And uh, I'm sure the, the ones that I will hear uh, next, they, they really do balance this uh, simplicity of, of listening in a sense. It's not difficult to listen to if you're not a well-trained classical musician, mm -hmm. you will still enjoy the music, enjoy these dance uh, themes. Um, and yet there's a, there's a huge technical challenge from the, the pieces that I've seen so far. They, they're really exciting for the player, for the performer to learn and, and challenge themselves and push themselves with. So I, I love the balance uh, for, for, for a performer. I think it's really fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, then the, we, I did say that you have a website and there I saw that you can download lots of your music and also that you've uh, rearranged your, a lot of your pieces for various different groups and different ensembles. Um, so uh, what, what kinds of ensembles are there uh, on your website and what kinds of pieces can people find there? Yes, well, thank you very much for bringing this up. So I basically, um, I'm committed to making my music accessible to everybody. I grew up in a situation where it wasn't easy to get music. I mean, this is many, many years ago, of course, before we had the internet, but also I was in a part of, of uh, Mexico that didn't have access to music stores or you know places where you could actually find repertoire or if you were able to it was really prohibitively expensive and um, so I decided at some point basically to make my music available for free to everybody in my website and so you will find every piece I have ever written um, and you can download it and I, all I ask is basically just that people uh, you know, acknowledge, of course, the authorship. And uh, I love hearing from people when they're going to play my music. But in any case, I also make sure that it's arranged in different uh, settings. So you can have it like, you know, for cello solo or cello duet or cello ensemble or cello and piano and all of this, because it allows a, a broader variety of people to enjoy it as well, right? I mean, there might be a version for cello solo of like my tango, for example, that is, you know, extremely difficult, but very, very exciting. But there might be another version like, you know, with piano and cello, where it's, you know, more uh, feasible for somebody who is, you know, perhaps not a professional soloist, but is, you know, an, uh, an intermediate or advanced uh, cello student. And uh, to have that, that range, I think, is important so that you can allow more people to, to enjoy this, this music. And um, it's been also, honestly, a, a joy to rediscover the music as you uh, take it to, to other uh, instruments or to other combinations because you have to uh, sort of explore different aspects of it. Um, and so I, I have some pieces for cello duet. I have pieces for uh, cello octet. I have um, many other uh, combinations that you can see listed in my website. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I'll be linking to the website, of course, in the description and at least on the YouTube video, you'll probably have a little card up there that you can you can click on directly to to visit the visit the website and for the blog post, it will already be linked. Um, so uh, what, uh, 
what's your otherwise your internet presence? Do you have anywhere else that we should be looking for you, or is it primarily your website? Sure. So I think actually uh, primarily it would be either my YouTube channel, and it's just basically Jose Elizondo Composer, um, or um, you know I've started to do a little bit of Instagram. Uh, my name there is Chelisondo, Cheli like you know the plural of cello. Chelisondo, <laughs> and uh, or you can find my, my composers page in uh, on Facebook. So it's again Jose Elizondo composer. Perfect. I will link to those two for sure. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share with us? Any last words? I just want to thank you because uh, it's uh, first of all thank you very much for being so kind and making me feel so comfortable in this interview, but also because it's um. It's interesting sometimes as a composer to, to get the opportunity to, to talk about your work or like to present it to people, right? Especially if you don't have like a big publishing house or agency or something behind you. Um, and I think it's, a, it, it's wonderful when, you know, given the opportunity to, to present, you know, what is behind the music. So it's not just like, oh, here's a piece and, you know, hopefully you like it. But uh, so that you see basically what, what is behind it, you know, that there is some, some message or there is a story or or something like that it always adds a lot of depth and so i'm very grateful for this type of opportunity thank you yeah thank you very much this was wonderful um that's uh, that's going to be it for today i feel like we could have talked for at least another hour um <laughs> but uh but it, maybe we'll do this again and in any case we can all look look for more of your of jose elizondo's music and uh videos of the performances of his music and everything that there is to see all right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.